Hello everyone, welcome to the second webinar of the day in the market entitled Transforming Finance, how back office accounting fuels front office opportunity. My name is Michael Imson and I'm the director of an editorial services agency called Financial and Business Publications and as well as moderating events for Ditto, the organiser of this week's wonderful series of Disrupt and Advance webinars, I'm a senior content editor at FT Live, the FT's conference division. I'm also a chartered member of the UK's Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment, the CISI, and the chairman of the CISI's FinTech Professional Forum. Joining me for this discussion are three experts on innovation in financial accounting. First, we have Kelvin Prescott, who's head of enterprise sales for O2 Telefonica UK, the mobile network operator owned by Telefonica of Spain. And second, we have Otto Bauer who advises insurance companies on financial matters. He has more than 20 years experience as a financial controller and chief financial officer in the insurance sector. He has led several projects to implement new accounting standards for insurance companies under US GAAP and IFRS, including IFRS 17. He's a Canadian chartered professional accountant, but currently lives in Zurich, and that's where he's dialing in from. And we have Elizabeth Sipier, Chief of Staff for Legerity, of course, a provider of cloud-based accounting rules software and sponsor of today's webinars. And uh, Elizabeth is in from the UK, as is um, Kelvin's in the UK as well. Um, as you know, we're going to be talking about innovation in financial accounting, innovation that not only helps company finance departments manage their finances better and run the business more profitably, but also helps them meet all their legal, regulatory and accounting standards requirements. And we'll be looking at the topic from the viewpoint of financial services companies because O2 is a major supplier of mobile technology to the financial sector. Otto has worked in the insurance sector for years and many of Legerity's clients are banks and insurance companies. Now, the format of this webinar is simple. First, I'll ask our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us about their job roles. Then I'll ask them a few key questions and listeners will be able to ask questions as well via the, the, the webinar site, so please do send some in. and We'll try to get them answered towards the end. There's a section on the site which explains how to do that. And then we'll wrap up with some concluding remarks. Uh, and we'll be stopping the session um, at 11.40 a.m., as close to that as possible, at which point we encourage you all to take part in the digital hangout taking place at www.ditto.tv forward slash MTD. So uh, let's get started with Kelvin of O2 Telefonica. Kelvin, tell us about yourself and your job. Um, hi, Michael, and uh, hello to everybody who's joined. Thank you for uh, for taking the time. Um, uh, just a little bit about me. I um, I run uh, sales and pre-sales teams for our business-to-business -business operation in, in O2, and though most of the people on this call will think of O2 and think immediately mobile, uh, what we do with large enterprises and, and financial services companies actually covers everything that you'd expect from a, a major telco. So we do everything from providing all the fixed networking, uh, context center, cloud storage, uh, as well as the, the more traditional sort of voice and mobile uh, telephony. Uh, and one of the things that's been really fascinating, particularly in the last three months with COVID-19, but I think over the course of the last five years has been the way in which um, the, the, the infrastructure that is used to deliver data and voice has then enabled a huge uh, innovation and huge amount of change within the financial services sector around what business models can work and where customers are and how you uh, and how you engage with them. So really looking forward to hearing the perspective of the other panelists on, on that topic as well. Well, th OK, thank you, Calvin. And thanks for uh, explaining the, the wider responsibilities or, or business activities of, of O2 beyond, beyond mobile. Um, Otto, what's your role right now? Uh, thank you, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, basically, starting from my background, which has been in audit and finance, um, the roles that Michael mentioned, it was easy for me to transition to the current role, which is advisory uh, in respect of uh, financial reporting and the like at a group and operating level. I mean, typically, my remit covers financial reporting, internal controls, consolidation processes, again, both at group and operationally. Um, one one aspect which is pretty hot this morning, or rather right now, not just this morning, um, IFRS 17, which is the 
IFRS standard for insurance enterprises. And what's special about it is one, not only that it took over 20 years to develop, but that it um, encompasses all aspects of an organization. It really touches everywhere in the organization and in even different functions. Uh, which, uh, from my perspective, is on the one hand a great learning experience, but also a great challenge. Um, and one of the other things that I'm offering at this point uh, for, for enterprises is also training on this standard and how to use it. So, thank you. Okay, thanks. And Elizabeth? Uh, thanks. Um, I have a background uh, in technology, uh, having worked for Hewlett Packard and uh, OMX NASDAQ. And for, uh, for quite a few years, I've worked in the financial uh, um, accounting technology space. And uh, I really love being at Legerity because we've got really next generation technology to help transform that accounting uh, area, as we're going to talk about later. And I act as chief, chief of staff. I spend a lot of time on business development, really getting close to our, our customers and prospects. But I also spend a lot of time on our processes as we scale up across development uh, services, support, and generally our operations. So we're really looking, I think like many software companies now, SaaS gives us the opportunity to have a different relationship with our customers, and we're looking to do that really well. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's get straight to the point then, which is um, the first topic of our conversation, which is the need to have a, a smooth running and technologically up-to-date back office, in this case, the finance department, to enable your front office departments to deliver first-rate sales and service to customers and make a healthy profit. So Kevin, Kelvin, sorry, um, you've got lots of big corporate clients, many of them in the financial services sector, and you see how their back office finance functions work. How many of them would you say operate suboptimally? What should they be doing to achieve peak efficiency and how do you help them reach those peaks? <laughs> uh, just because it's a slight, slight laugh when I hear it. I, um, I try not to not to tell any of, of our customers that they might be operating suboptimally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the it's not the ideal way to start the conversation. But what what is interesting when we talk to certainly big financial services companies uh, and financial institutions is that if we look historically around how they run their infrastructure, how they run their back office. Um, most large financial services customers and, and companies, they kind of built much of their own infrastructure over a long period of time. So they had their own private infrastructure. Many of them looked like telecoms companies in their own right or looked like IT departments in their own right. And they remain in that, in that way as well. So there are plenty of examples of, of entirely private telecoms networks that are run within the financial services sector for things like payment processing and, and, and broking and things like that. And, and what we that was um, for quite a long period of time optimal. Yeah, that was the that was the most efficient and effective way of running your operation. Similarly, with having large contact centres to handle um, consumer or customer facing uh, operations and those sorts of things. So I think what it's fair to say is that most big corporate clients have an optimal infrastructure and and, and operation for the technology that existed a decade ago. So it's not that they were suboptimal in themselves. It's more that as uh, as the capacity of both cloud services and the capacity of mobile networks and different ways of connecting people increased, is that it created new opportunities and new business models that didn't exist before. And the challenge for really big corporate clients is how do I get to that that new space quickly enough? And how do I redefine what optimal means? Because uh, I'll use just by way of example, um, the the huge changes in people's location uh, that that were forced by uh, lockdown is yeah. that in, in most back office functions are run based on a cost efficiency model. How do I absolutely squeeze every last penny out of my overhead costs and run it as close to the bonus as, as can be? And many of the listeners will, I'm sure, have experienced those kind of budget constraints and pressures themselves. But if you think about resilience, which is another way of talking about what an optimal infrastructure is, well, resilience means being able to really quickly flex the capacity, move your people around and still deliver a great customer experience. And it's in those areas that new infrastructure <clears throat> and using mobile and, uh, and cloud and being able to have the right security posture over those services actually means that some of our customers were able to re, you know, move their contact center operations all the way to home and still be fully compliant within just a few days, whereas other organizations really struggled because they just didn't have 
um, uh, an infrastructure that was op optimized to be resilient. They had an infrastructure that was optimized to be cheap or cost efficient. And I think that's really the challenge for a lot of big organizations is how to, is how to do that. Now, whether they do it right, then you can be brilliant because you can actually enable your people to be far more productive. You can enable them to adopt new ways of working uh, and spend more time talking to the customer. But the real challenge is how do I get from a legacy infrastructure model that was based on locations into a cloud or a mobile infrastructure model that's based on people being able to do everything they, they need to do wherever they were, are, whether that's at home or whether that's in an office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah, so some good, good points there about using mobile and cloud. And uh, Elizabeth, on to you next. Your, your firm's a provider of cloud-based software to help companies comply with all relevant accounting rules and your clients are mainly the finance departments of banks, insurance companies and telcos. What are the typical failings or inefficiencies um, or whatever euphemism you'd like to use uh, that you see in their accounting processes when you take on a, a new client engagement and how do you help them address these inefficiencies? I rather like Kelvin's uh, comment that I, we don't usually start with their inefficiencies, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but we, we talk a lot about where they can go. The real issue is that finance and accounting have rarely had the lion's share of investment and um, certainly IFRS 17 is creating an opportunity for that. So, so you know, you can look at a finance department. If the regulations haven't changed for 20 years, there's a risk that they haven't really spent serious money for a, for a long time. And that leaves them with just being out of date in, as Kelvin was describing really, you know, the technology they're using is old and they haven't spent the money to upgrade it. And there are really simple things, you know, that the, the user interface has changed, you know, what you can do, the simplicity you, where you can present uh, finance processes has changed. I was very interested this week, you know, Apple said they're going to um, use their own chips, which they already do in the iPad and the iPhone. And, you know, that whole unifying a customer experience in the cloud, whatever the device they're using, these things now become available if you're going to make the investment in, in technology and finance. So you're kind of doing a leapfrog. And the other big areas are the whole question of automation and scale, being able to use processes in accounting for a large global company. Whereas, you know, it used to be that we'd sit there at night and we'd wait for all the operating systems to run. And then you'd have this tiny amount of time where you'd be trying to squeeze your accounting in. And of course, now with the kind of grid technologies and new technologies that are available, you can run accounting that would take three or four hours. You can run it in a matter of minutes. So they can really do much more with the capacity that's now, now, um, available. The last big change, I think, will be that they can make their finance accurate data available to the whole organization. You know, historically, a lot of parts of the organization generate their own numbers and their own business intelligence. And once you've got a really good finance architecture in place and you're using some of the data opportunities that are available now, everybody can be working off data that directly links to the reported financials. And I think that gives a much um, lower cost organization, actually much less reconciliation, probably less argument. So there's a lot they can do. Okay, thank you. Um, Otto, I'd like to, to ask you a similar question, but um, in the context of IFRS 17. So there are two parts to my question, um, mm -hmm. and it's in the context of using IFRS 17 to introduce efficiencies. So the first part is that uh, you're an IFRS 17 expert, which comes into effect, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, January 2023. And it will introduce sweeping reforms to how insurers report their profits. So, first of all, very briefly, what are the key elements of those reforms before I go on to the second part of the question? Yes. Well, I guess sort of top, starting from top down, I mean, the new standard drives for greater transparency and comparability. And, and basically, that's also on, on existing contracts as well as new business, um, which hopefully leads to greater insight on the enterprises for investors. Now, it uses things now as, as more or enhanced use of current values, expected cash flows and the like. But what does all that mean? Um, it sounds great to the investors, happy, um, but for the enterprises or the preparers, it means the big challenges. Uh, greater granularity uh, requiring analysis at contract level. And what does this translate into? More pressure and greater needs for systems, processes and people to accommodate greater detail and disclosure. So there's a lot to do. Yeah. So the second part of my question then is, um, um, should insurers or do insurers regard IFRS 17 as an opportunity 
to reduce back office inefficiencies or do they look at, look at it mainly as a, a compliance exercise? Well, in my experience, what I've seen is those who've started a little earlier in the game on this, which is uh, obviously the larger ones, um, have tried to get the benefits out of this process. In other words, to, to look, analyze the processes, uh, try to eliminate waste, wastage or, or newly define the processes in an IFRS 17 world. The, the word of caution here, and it's precisely the, the key word is time, the longer you wait to start on this road, the less time you're going to have to look at the benefits and the more pressure there is to make it simply a compliance exercise just to get to the post. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Okay, um, well, let's move on to, um, we've, we've dealt with uh, back office uh, inefficiencies, or rather, as uh, Elizabeth and Kelvin would prefer to talk about um, back office opportunities. Uh, <laughs> you put the positive for the negatives because you're in sales, the journalists put the negative and they ignore the positives because we're journalists and we sensationalize and look at all the bad things happening. But uh, no, I do understand the, the, where you're coming from. But let's have a look at um, positively now how back office improvements can fuel front office opportunities. So, Kelvin, can you give me some concrete examples of where you've seen back office efficiencies in the finance department feed through to the front office departments, helping them improve sales and service to customers and make this profit? Sure. I, mean, I, I won't use specific customer names in, on, on, on this forum, but um, w there are probably two or three areas where we see pretty consistent improvements in business performance from doing back office transformation. Uh, and, and part of the reason I, I avoid this sort of cost reduction, cost optimization piece um, uh, as being the lens through which to look at it is that um, the real opportunity uh, for both financial services customers and indeed any large uh, B2C operation, so uh, any business that has uh, will typically have a large contact center or is selling to consumers and selling what can be quite complex products, the, the real opportunity is bringing the back office, is blurring the difference between back office and front office so that the customer is able to, to deal with and the customer service or the operations agents are actually able to add value to the customer themselves. So we all know that many of those kind of scale and contact center operations um, carry quite a lot of failure waste. So it's quite frustrating and difficult sometimes for customers or indeed internal uh, uh, salespeople to get things done in an efficient way. So what we've seen a lot um, from what we call the digital disruptors, so the, the more uh, innovative and forward thinking organizations in these areas who are able to invest, is what they've done is, is they've, um, they've done a, a few different things. The first is they've enabled the infrastructure to mean that they can put certain compliance activities and, and other things into an automated environment so that it's, it's much easier for people who are in backers function to focus on the question of, which customers are the ones that are our priority? How do I actually serve them more quickly? And how do I present them with the information that's relevant? Or if they're dealing via a, a forward sales team or field sales team, how do I make sure those salespeople have got the right information available to them? And they do that by, I'll come back, obviously I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a telco um, a salesperson. They do that by putting in place the infrastructure that allows that. That's about having really secure, um, connectivity, uh, but using public infrastructure, which is where a lot of the flexibility and the, the cost savings can come from. And then using that as a platform to connect all of their, their people using you know, modern contact center software and then modern uh, financial services uh, software, such as those that, that Elizabeth and others um, uh, organizations provide. So you can give a joined up experience and then you don't have as much failure demand in the system. And I've seen, for example, in some of our uh, customers that, for, uh, for example, provide loans and, and payments associated with retail products, um, that, that they've seen you know, 30, 40 percent improvements in their conversion rates, for example, of, uh, of um, uh, having customers attach or take up financial services products simply because they were able to integrate together a view of customer creditworthiness, um, uh, the different financing options and the way the product could be presented at the point of sale in a way that made it much, much easier for the salespeople to do it. 
Now, that's a back office process. It was heavily automated. Um, but what it did is it drove really significant performance improvements. So for me, I keep coming back to this piece. It's the back office efficiency isn't the piece I think is most interesting. It's how do I actually enable the back office to be much closer to the customer that then drives additional revenue opportunities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Elizabeth, um, Legerity's business proposition is quite a narrow one. You provide accounting and software to company finance departments. So to what extent do you analyse these companies' front-end business operations and strategic objectives and then advise their finance departments on how they can contribute to the success of those operations and objectives? Um. It's a really good question. You, you'd always think that finance was somewhere in the back end, but uh, when we're working with a customer, we always start with their strategy, actually. Um, I was working on a wonderful Middle East um, insurer recently, and I was so impressed. That annual report has loads of pictures of women. And, you know, it, it just sets the right tone for, for where they're going and, and what they're trying to do. Um, you st we start with their business strategy. Product innovation is, is often a big driver. You know, if, if we weren't doing IFRS 17 at the moment, that when I started in accounting software, it was when all the banks were putting in swaps and other instruments and really, you know, uh, enabling, having the back office enable agility in the front office. So we always start with the business strategy, just, you know, which products are they growing? Is it a runoff business? It, it changes the way you approach the accounting. The other strategies we always look at is the BI strategy. So once you know where they're going, they will have a supporting plan about how they deliver intelligence to the organization to monitor their KPIs, monitor their performance, encourage you know, the key players in the front office to deliver. So we always look closely at that. And then of course, we're very um, keen on supporting people as they move to next generation technology. So we like to align with the IT strategy and, and really the customers we win are those that often are are more thought forward thinking they've got somebody in technology that's very comfortable with moving forward and and not exactly a risk taker anymore covid's removed a lot of that but somebody who's got the right processes and controls to help the organization move from whatever their current architecture is to next generation architectures in that process what we're really doing is making sure you know as otto said you know we actually try to put in ifrs 17 compliant solutions now which is what a lot of people it, it's getting later and a lot of people only want compliance and then we really have an eye on the next generation moves that they're going to need to make and we try to put in an architecture that enables them to be compliant now and then move forward i think it's really key that finance provides that agility and that information to feed into the strategy and also the finance processes are not onerous they're not um, causing time delays and they're not expensive so that they can really you know be part of the value of the organization rather than any kind of constraint the other thing you know i think often this question sort of makes you feel that finance is, is some kind of narrow back-end function but i never look at it like that i've ever since i've worked in it what i really love and and otto started with this it touches the whole organization and particularly something like ifrs 17 that is really changing your actuary processes and um, how you look at contracts with customers and 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 how their the revenue is recognized so it's much more and the fact that you actually get a view across a whole global organization all its legal entities really gives you a completely um, completely kind of global perspective and 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 it comes back to this concept of, of using finance data to deliver intelligence on how an organization is performing if you've got really good finance data and they've got it at some kind of granular level with links to the channel the salesperson you can work out you know where you're really performing and i think it's really really powerful so i don't see it as a narrow i see it as kind of the widest part of the organization mm -hmm. okay thanks um otto there's no doubt that the back office needs to understand the needs of the business in key areas like products services and sales strategy if it's to help the front office take advantage of all of these opportunities so how do you think the back office should improve communications with the front office to gain that understanding yeah well first i i'd like to start in terms of what is the preconception of what accountants do or or financial reporting specialists let's say we all remember the accountant with the visor on his head and and he would do the monthly or yearly accounts and so if you were in the front office uh, trying to sell a product or or even do product design 
uh, the accountant just was was absolutely hopeless to help you uh, in that endeavor. And and so what would happen is the front office would have to gather its own information and and set up its own systems, etc. Um, what's happening now, and for me, that's why I find IFRS 17 in the insurance space is such a revolution. It's forcing the accountants to learn the language of the front office and the, and the business and learn about the products. It's, it's not just a, a, a nice to have anymore. It's a must. And what that means is, uh, and I assume there is some engagement, hopefully, between finance and the front office already, but this is an opportunity to sit down and show what's coming what is new, what can we deliver, and hopefully how fast. And obviously that, that uh, dovetails nicely with what Elizabeth is saying. Uh, speed is, is important for the front end. And so as we get more up to speed, as our processes get more ship shape, um, we can hopefully eliminate some of this duplication or duplicative information gathering. So I think on that basis, that's a platform to establish a hopefully an ongoing dialogue on how finance and the front office can work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting. Also, just kind of reflecting on that. Because uh, for, forgive me for interrupting, uh, no, Michael. I just, I just really, uh, I, I like the analogy of the uh, the, the traditional uh, the traditional accountant there. Um, it, 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 when I've been dealing with lots of different different companies, a lot of what I see is this blurring of back office to front office, which is, I think, is what you're saying, isn't it? That that yeah. the, the, the 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 finance officers and the the, you know, the people providing their supports, what uh, what these changes do is it drives them to look at it from the perspective of the customer and the perspective of what actually drives value into the PL. Uh, I think is, is that fair? Because uh, it, it yes, sounds absolutely. Like the real... to look at the drivers. Yep. And, yeah. and again, for me, it's also about, uh, it's, it's good for me because I speak more than one language, but I, I see accounting has always been a language, but now it's more important to marry that language with the language of the business. And mm. IFRS 17 is forcing that. It's, you know, we never do things if we don't have to, and now we have to. And, but now it's time to grasp the opportunity and to do it. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd like to um, talk to Kelvin about how you've provided mobiles to uh, bank contact centers, uh, especially at the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Mobiles to contact center staff. Yeah, so sure. Work from uh, home. Uh, absolutely. And, and this is, I, I guess, when we talk about, when we talk about this, this. Um, I guess the theme that was mentioned before about the difference between just pure cost efficiency and and what what optimal means in terms of your 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 back office or your support capability, um, it is that um, when we had the coronavirus outbreak, obviously what it does it did is it forced seventy eighty percent of the working age population or the working population of the UK to suddenly stop moving, uh, and that included all of the. Uh, the people who would normally make sure that whether it's insurance or banking or other kind of financial services, all, all the things that actually enable uh, the economy to function, well, all of their staff were suddenly forced to work from home at the same time. Uh, and one of the things that we uh, we saw across that was then a, a sudden um, a sudden need to do things that lots of financial services companies or organisations with large contact centres have to do, which is they all had a roadmap around flexible working, and they all had a roadmap around move to cloud, and they all had a roadmap around their, you know, what they were going to do in terms of their customer engagement and their, you know, their their omni-channel approach. But that roadmap normally had two, three, four years uh, of different activities. COVID suddenly forced them to say, if you don't implement some of these things in the next two weeks, your business stops working. Uh, and so we worked with a number of, uh, of organizations who needed to put their contact centers able to work from home, but they had to be FCA uh, compliant. They had to do things like things like call recording. They had to manage inbound and outbound call transfer. They had to give the people themselves uh, a necessary device and be able to control uh, the data that's stored on that device so that they were able to protect customers' data. And they then needed to be able to do that and deliver it really, really quickly, like within three or four working days. And what we saw is that those organizations that were already more advanced in terms of that move to cloud and having open infrastructure and, and having security that was built on open infrastructure, they were able to do that. We had one company that was able to, to mobilize uh, you know, 1,500 contact center agents who had previously to go into the office. Within four working days, they were able to do their jobs and work from home. Um, uh, other organizations did much, much harder. And, and I think for them then, optimal isn't necessarily cheapest it's actually most resilient. It's able to be most flexible. 
Yeah. Were these contact centre staff using these mobile phones? Were they using their own phones through some sort of fancy network that had all this audibility, call tracing and cyber? Or did you actually have to supply them with uh, purpose or telemade phones? Um, uh, well, the, the, the phones aren't tailor-made, but certainly all the configuration is. So what you can do now in a way which probably wasn't possible five or six years ago is you can provide a phone and it will be a you know, standard a, a smartphone as you would know it but actually it comes preloaded with the kind of lockdown and controls that you would expect from a desktop when you know, would have been an old desktop pc so you can control what data is stored and how it's stored you control what applications are available you control uh, and, and encrypt it or, or put in place the necessary protections in terms of security uh, and then if you have the kind of cloud services that are there uh, configured by default, it means that all of your compliance activities are being conducted in the cloud. So you, you can you can enable people to do what was previously quite a controlled role and required controlled infrastructure. You can allow them to do that from home. Yeah, well, uh, and the extent of this is that those certainly, certainly a number of customers that we've had who've, who've been forced to go down this route are then saying, actually, I'm not sure what I need my office for. They're really rethinking their real estate strategy and they're discovering that even if it were 2% more expensive uh, per head in terms of telecoms, it probably saves them a massive amount in terms of real estate and infrastructure, as well as having people who are more motivated and engaged to uh, to stay with the company and ret retain their best talent. Yeah, yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, Elizabeth, um, your software is primarily provided over the cloud. Has it always been done that way or is it a fairly recent development? Uh, we're quite fortunate. So Legerity is about five years old. Uh, so the software was uh, designed for the cloud and um, designed at a time where there was a much better understanding of security features. So, so we use uh, OASP, the Open Web Application uh, Security Project, which you know has thousands of developers all over the world. So we run a um, software development lifecycle that has cloud security integral to the way you develop your software and the way you design and architect it for security and the way you test you know, during the development process for vulnerabilities. So we are one of those um, fortunate people who who started their development at a time when cloud was relatively well understood. And there was some huge scares. You know, one of the OASP um, areas is known software that has vulnerabilities in it. So like if we all remember the NHS issue with, with some of the Microsoft uh, older products or older software, you know, so, so we're lucky in that we didn't start on premise. We, we did start in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good. Um, Otto, um, you were making the point when we were preparing for this that uh, um, whether you're um, you're making your back office uh, more efficient or looking for the opportunities to to do whatever for regulatory reporting purposes or for internal needs, um, should you also be looking at whether you can accommodate new requirements more efficiently? In other words, um, could you, when you're improving things, you I, step back and redesign whole aspects of the process, not just for internal needs or regulatory, regulatory reporting, but for efficiency needs? Yeah, uh, I guess I'll start with a, a, a low-hanging fruit on this one, and that is, uh, in my experience, I've been involved with life insurers, and it's amazing how quickly you can get a multitude of platforms uh, because you have, if you will, different generations of products that have come into being over the years. And let's just say that you sit down and you want to implement IFRS 17, and you're going to you're gonna take all this multitude of platforms and you're going to make them IFRS 17 compliant. If you have, say, 10 different platforms and you've got 10 times the cost of doing it versus if you had only one platform, um, and obviously then you can be more streamlined going forward. So before you even enter the, the IFRS 17 space, you have to think about, well, what do I have that's arguably duplicative, for example, uh, and what can I do to at least reduce the number of systems that I have so that my processes are less cumbersome, cost less to maintain, um, and generally speaking, I can spend my time on other things other than maintaining 10 systems. So uh, I hope that's a good example for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to move on to um, identity verification, which um, Kelvin's uh, touched upon. Um, Kelvin, how, how do banks and your other clients verify the digital identities of their customers, and how does your technology help them do that? 
Um, so uh, digital identity verification is, is, is this brutally horrible um, area. So I'll, I'll, I'll caveat it by saying that everybody, I think every major technology player and I think financial services company has, uh, has got some set of programs and initiatives to try and get to this this goal we all have, which is a, uh, a high integrity, low cost way of checking that Michael is who he says he is. Um, I think our role and what we tend to do within the process is uh, is not to try and solve the problem in one swoop uh, by saying here's, here's an absolute guaranteed way of doing it, but actually by providing a series of layered ways of reducing the risk of somebody being able to um, uh, to misrepresent who they are. So uh, at a simple level, the obvious things are things like SIM, uh, SIM and device identification that give you that confidence that you'd always have that says, actually, I know who, I know the device that is that is making this call, or I know the source of this call. Um, but actually, as you as you get into the the way in which telecoms technology has evolved now, is this huge ability to be able to do things like implement inline fraud detection to uh, to augment the verification processes that are already in place um, via people like uh, via the, the, the major paper uh, providers like PayPal, uh, Visa and, and MasterCard. And what you can do is rather than say, I'm going to absolutely guarantee that it's Otto or it's Michael. What I can do is I can reduce the risk that it's not Otto, and I can reduce the risk that it's not Michael. And I think for us, that's our that's our strategy is is rather than trying to come up with a a single solution that is is that meets all bases, it's one that actually can work with different customers' own verification processes and augment the risk profiling or the the identification that they've already got. So, for example, you know somebody calls in and they might know the insurance policy number. But actually, we can augment that by saying that we can be, you know, I can tell you that it's actually coming from the mobile number that's registered to that person. Uh, and then that can be coupled within contact center with, with things like fraud detection that would, would allow you to monitor voice patterns and stress patterns that might give you an indication of whether or not there's something untoward happening. Uh, just as an example of the kind of things that uh, that you can now do. Yeah, yeah. OK, thanks. Um, do you, do you, final uh, question for Elizabeth before we go into the kind of summing up. Um, Elizabeth, on the, on the question of identity, how, how do you assure your clients that identi identities can be verified in your cloud-based environment? It's actually an interesting question. Uh, most of our clients have, feel very, uh, they're really very um, uh, controlling in this area. And for most of them, they will have an architecture around uh, security and identification. So the important thing is that we are enabling them to use that and to use the current um, uh, security processes. So generally we provide a, a link into that architecture using SAML, the security um, um, sort of language for us to uh, exchange with them and then they move into two-factor authentication and the other controls that they have internally. If that's not the case, then we would implement uh, an architecture for two-factor authentication and control in that manner for our clients. But generally, um, particularly, there have been a lot of um, uh, changes in the area around letting software companies manage your users, and generally most clients do that for themselves, and they actually control even the roles and responsibilities and who can access which data and, and keep that away from us as a, as a provider. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, look, um, we've almost out of time. We've got two or three minutes left, so I'd just like to ask each of you one final question, which is the same for all of you, and it's to allow you to, to sum up, and you've, you've got 30 seconds or so to, to sum up. And we'll start with Kelvin. Kelvin, we've discussed this topic at length, so what are the, the two or three most important points you've said that you'd like listeners to remember? I think there's only there's two I've really come across. One is uh, this piece that optimised does not mean most cost efficient. Resilience and, ag and agility uh, and need to be part of it. And I think the other piece that I've certainly taken away from what what Arto is saying is bringing that finance function into the front office and more cl and close to the customer is one of the best ways of, of of making sure that you get the right balance between flexibility and efficiency and, and agility. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, uh, Otto. Your pearls of wisdom for people to remember. Sure. I guess. I'd start with saying that communication is number one. In other words, outside of your department and, and, or your silo is, is the only way to ensure success. Um, when you've got 
mandated changes, especially or any time that you have changes, not to approach with simply a compliance mindset. The effort is worth it. And if you look at the processes and take the opportunity to review and adjust where possible, um, the rewards are in, yeah, uncountable, shall we say, invaluable. Yep, thanks Otto. Elizabeth. It's really interesting. I think I agree with Otto and Kelvin that the sort of language and communication is probably uh, the most important thing and this conversation has reinforced it. Interesting, when I uh, worked a lot with a bank banking accounting and investment banking, there was always an accounting function somewhere in the middle between the front and the, the back end of the accounting and the conversation was easier. When I got into insurance, I was very surprised by how the actuaries and the sort of um, uh, uh, policy management people have a completely different language to finance and, and that really needed to be addressed before you could actually get a lot of the value out of out of what what you can do with with a finance transformation or even IFRS 17 compliance. So that's my number one. Number two, actually, is I think people often overlook the potential of tidying up the back office. You know just what it can mean for the whole business. I think there is much more value. I know now, as as um, Otto said, there's this real understanding that you want to serve the customer well. And I actually sit on a few boards where I'm the digital transformation person, and it really is so pointless to put something right at the front facing the customer that doesn't have accurate data coming from the back. I mean, you know, you just create more problems. So, so I think the other thing is the potential as you sort out your back office to improve the whole performance of the organization. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, that's, that's very uh, informative. And I, I think um, what I take away from it was the first point you made about uh, it's not just a technical topic or an accounting topic, but it, it's the, the importance of language and communication. So. Um, we've been talking, you talk numbers if you're in an accounting department and we're talking technology to help um, the company understand those numbers, but it's ultimately also a people thing as well. So people communications are, are essential. Um, so thank you very much. Um, this, this has been a live broadcast, uh, but it's been recorded and it's going to be available soon to, to uh, listen to on demand on the Ditto website. Please visit uh, www ditto.tv forward stroke MTD right now for a digital hangout with our panel and other audience members. So that's it. All that remains for me to do is to thank our listeners for listening and to thank our speakers for taking part. So thank you, Kelvin Prescott, Otto Barr, Otto Barr and Elizabeth Supier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.